So the, the text verse is taken from Hebrews 10.35. Uh, the phrase was something that I heard on a talk show of two Christians that were speaking. Some of you might know Max McLean, and uh, he was the one that actually quoted this from a poet. Uh, I didn't catch the name of it, and I didn't go back and find the name, but Max McLean is in a movie now about C.S. Lewis, and uh, from what I hear, it's very good. Uh, he used to do a one-man play in New York City, and he would do C.S. Lewis, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled because I met him through the radio. I used to do a radio show many years ago, and we have many mutual friends. He's a great man. And it just really struck me uh, that this is so true for right now. If we're not willing to defend something, the other side will take it. So we have to take a stand for the truth of the word. Amen? All right, so this is what it says. What we don't defend, we soon abandon. Hebrews 10 in the Passion, verse 35, says, Don't lose your bold, courageous faith. <laughs> so... If he's saying don't lose it, that means they had it. How many here have bold, courageous faith? Just do it by faith. Yes, we do. We do. That's who we are. That spirit that, that created the whole universe is alive in you. Isn't that amazing? In Genesis, it says the spirit of God was hovering over the earth. That's the Holy Spirit that we have inside of us. And try not to just turn him into a person. I know we, we can call him that, but I think that limits our thinking. It's much bigger than just a person. It's the eternal spirit of God that created everything lives inside of you. Like, whoa. And it, with Adam and Eve in the garden, there was no limit other than their physical bodies, but there was no death in the garden. So this was man and woman made in the image of God to live and commune with him forever. And then sin comes in and brings that decay and that death that happens. So we have a taste right now through Holy Spirit in us of what we will have for eternity. It's only in part what we will have in full later, and it's called a down payment, right? We can all relate to a down payment. You don't have to pay for the whole house. If you put down a down payment, you have the title deed. <laughs> and the more you yield to Holy Spirit, the closer you are to what it's going to be like for eternity. I'm going to touch on that today a little bit. So you already have the power source in you. And I would hope that we leave here today with a greater willingness to tap into it. And the way you get to that is by putting other things to death that are blocking that access to that power source. Sorry if that sounds a little too, what, whatever the word is, crude. But Jesus said we have to pick up our cross daily. And, and, and the cross means crucifixion. So whatever... I want in God is on the other side of that cross. He's going to raise up the new me on the other side. So don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. Can you look at somebody and say, you are destined for a great reward. Hallelujah. <laughs> he don't need a mic. <laughs> so listen. The great reward is that we're going to rule and reign with Christ for eternity, all right? It's not that we make the cut and we get, to, we get to get into heaven when we die. That's an awesome thing. It's sure better than the other option, but it's also much bigger than just making the cut and getting into heaven. It's going to rule and reign for eternity. That's the great reward that we have. Don't lose your bold, courageous faith. You have it. Don't lose it. Because look, Things are worth defending. And right in the first chapter of Genesis, God created man in his own image. So when I look at another person, even all those people coming in and out of that shop right yesterday, I wish I had been there. I was on a plane flying back. But every one of those people was made in God's image. They may not know God, but God knows them. And in the, in the Bible it says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on some flesh. <laughs> so what does that mean? That just because they don't identify as a Christian doesn't mean that the Spirit's not in there. And as you witness and as you demonstrate love and as you say things, as the Bible says, when, you open, when we open our mouths, He will fill it. If it's His words coming out of our mouth, it resonates with something inside them that they know is true. And wow, somebody witnessed to you, that's how you became a Christian, right? So God created man in His own image. That's worth defending. And then it goes on to say, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And that's one of the things that's under attack right now, male and female. Now you could just choose, uh, one of the comedians said, it's a jump ball, whatever you want, pick whatever side you want, male or, male or female. No, sorry, 
that's a foundational truth that we can't concede. We, we can't concede the language. And I'm not conceding marriage either, okay? <laughs> no, sorry. Man and a woman. You leave your mother and father, and you become united into one, and it's in the maleness and femaleness that we represent God, because he made us male and female. That's a long discussion, but you got to be real careful that you don't concede the language to a group of people who want to overthrow order and, and, and overthrow the truth of the word of God, and that doesn't mean we don't like those people. We have to pray for them, but we have to also take a stand for what we know is true, and, and that, uh, that's the church you're in right now, okay? Uh, we're not, we're, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman, a biological man and a woman, and, th and this minister has overseen a lot of weddings, but I'm not gonna oversee a same-sex marriage, because that's not a marriage. So the way the Lord showed it to me is, uh, like an immune system, we as the church are supposed to be the immune system for the culture when it comes to morals and ethics and the way we live our lives. If we're actively engaged with the community, they will not want to sin because there will be some, what, what we heard up here today, there was something that was getting touched in the hearts of those people. They go in and buy something and they say, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give to someone in need. You know, the area is known for having a lot of money. People around here are wealthy in Far Hills and up the mountain in Bernersville. But there's a huge number of people that are, 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 are week to week. And, and the day laborers that, that serve a lot of those folks. And you understand. But they're, they're hidden. They're, they're not what you see. And we used to have a cafe right across from the train station in Bernersville. We met the whole community, rich and poor, and everybody in between. And we used to do something called Unity Day where we would have a picnic in the park um, to raise money for the fire department and the police in our area. One year we had 4,500 people. Yeah. And, and it was this, the, I didn't even call it this, the town people called it Unity Day. And I knew because I, I would open the, the cafe at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> My family's in the garbage business, so I got started really young, getting up really early, and it never left me. Um, so, you know, we now do deliverance, so that's another form of the garbage business. We get the critters out. <laughs> so we used to serve coffee, and one person would be a wealthy, you know, you could tell by the size of the rock on the lady's finger, she had some money because I'm just kind of handing the coffee over and I'm like, whoa, where's the sunglasses? And then the next guy would be dressed to go mow lawns. And God looks at each one of those people with equal value. See, we don't always do that. But on this unity day, everybody was together. And there was a stand for empanadas. <laughs> and some of the people up on Burnsville Mountain didn't even know how to uh, say empanada but they kept coming back for more. And the kids were all playing together on the inflatable rides and nobody cared if you were Hispanic or Latin or whatever you were, like you were kids playing. I don't know if you ever noticed, but kids laughing, it all sounds the same no matter what language they're from. <laughs> it's a kid laughing. <laughs> That's how God looks at us. We just have to stop doing that. And look, let's just be honest. The church hasn't always been great at living that out. And part of the rage and the anger in the culture today is because, you know, if they wanted to think about Christianity, there have been many seasons where we haven't been consistent with what the book says, right? God judges by our hearts, not by our appearance, right? Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. And I wasn't raised in the South, so I can't really honestly say that I would have been courageous enough to stand up against segregation but I sure hope I would have been. Because there's just got to come a point when you're reading this and saying, well, you know, our church isn't segregated. We were with uh, a couple from Mississippi once, and they said out of the 53 churches in their county, they were the only integrated church. So 52 out of 53 were either all white or all black. Sorry. You know, like you said, I didn't live down there. I I'm not saying I could have been a hero or anything, but... Somehow, they thought that, that, that it was still consistent to say you can't come in our church because of the color of your skin. 
How hurtful would that be? And how could you take any meaning from the message? Jesus said, do as they say, but not as they do. But I don't want them saying that about us. Right? So as soon as you start saying somebody can't come in, unless it's because they're dangerous and they're going to hurt somebody, then it's not his church anymore. So look, you know, there's a lot of rage in the culture. Some of it is justifiable, but, but if you live your life looking in the rearview mirror, you don't change. Because there's no solution in the rearview mirror. You got to look through the windshield, and we want to be agents of change in the positive way. And nobody thinks feeding the poor is a bad idea. <laughs>